Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. Where you've got a more robust economy, there is greater investment in infrastructure generally. So there are many parts of Asia where physical accessibility, for example, is very good, whether that's in Japan or Korea. But I would say there's quite a bit of inequality or inequity in many countries in the region. If a family has a child with a disability and the social support and the social security is not there, then that family may find it very difficult to continue working at the same level and therefore their income starts to drop, but also therefore their capacity to care for their child with a disability starts to drop. I had opportunities to hear a lot of stories in various different countries, from Timor to the Pacific Islands and of course in Asia as well, Cambodia and recently Vietnam. What's been really amazing is to see and to reflect on myself as an individual on how to view disability in those different lenses. In this episode, Living with Disability in Asian Societies. Here to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia research specialist at the University of Melbourne. Life can be challenging enough for people with disabilities in wealthy Western countries, but what about for those in developing nations where quality of life and meaningful economic participation are a far tougher ask? In the Asia-Pacific region, it's estimated that one in every six people is living with a debilitating physical or cognitive impairment. They often have fewer rights and protections than their counterparts in the rich world in the face of greater discrimination and exposure to violence. So what is the lived experience of people with disabilities and the people who support them in the Asia-Pacific? How do cultural attitudes towards disability colour that experience? And how are people with disabilities recognised and assisted by their governments and other institutions? Joining me to discuss these questions are three people who research or work in the disability sector across a number of countries in Southeast Asia. Dr Cathy Vaughan of the Centre for Health Equity at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health Alex Devine, a senior research officer at the Nossel Institute for Global Health, as well as a doctoral student, and engineer and social entrepreneur Hoi Nguyen, founder of Enabler Interactive, which develops training technologies for use in disability and aged care. To all three of you, welcome to Ear to Asia. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Cathy, let's start by drawing a picture, if you like, of people living with disabilities in Asia. The UN estimates that the number is 690 million. Do you think that's accurate? I think it probably is. Um, The work that's been done into modelling the proportion of people in a population that have disability has been going on for a long time. There's a lot of people who've put a lot of effort into getting an accurate um, idea of the um, proportion of a population who have some kind of um, impairment. And Yes, I think that is an accurate representation. You say some kind of impairment. Alex, do the numbers encompass all disabilities, whether they're physical, whether they're intellectual? Yeah, absolutely. I think the modelling that has been done by agencies such as the WHO and the UN World Bank definitely do encompass all types of disability. So whether that be a psychosocial disability associated with someone's mental illness, whether it's a cognitive disability or a physical or intellectual disability, I think sometimes... What we don't have, though, is an accurate picture at each country level. So we have fantastic modelling based often on Western country data collection. But across the region, we have still very different ways of collecting data on disability, both within countries and then across countries as well. It's interesting that you make that point because while the UN estimates there's 690 million, it also talks about a large uh, underestimation, if you like, of the number of people with disabilities. And in fact, so large, they put that at some 450 million. Hoi, why do you think that there is such an underreporting? Yeah, uh, I think it's all to do with the how it gets translated, you know, the terminology, especially when we get to the space of non-physical disabilities or non-physical impairments and how the locals sort of understands that. It translates to how we ask the questions on the ground to get accurate data. And I think that's quite missing. Um, and the nuances behind that and the senses locally, there's a whole range of challenges with that, but I think it's how it gets translated, you know, from what we understand as display of different impairments, cognitive, etc., how that gets translated and asked questions locally. Is it also, though, about how people are prepared to answer those questions? 
Yes. From that perspective, are they comfortable to answer that? Because, you know, you know, some of the spaces I've seen, it's generally quite taboo to speak or a little bit of stigma in terms of speaking up about your family members who have a disability because you're disclosing who your family member is and, you know, what sort of impairments or disadvantage they may have and how your others and neighbours can get to know about that. So there's absolutely those barriers. Cathy, would you agree that there are sort of two sides to this discussion? There's the cultural overlay, the social context, if you like, which can take into account personal prejudices. And then on the other hand, you've got the economic or the infrastructure, the the physical built environment, the, the government funding side. There's sort of two quite distinct elements to this conversation. Yes, I do agree that there are two quite distinct issues that need to be addressed through policy and programs and interventions, but I also think they're quite linked because if you have a community where there are high levels of prejudice around disability and discrimination against people with disability because of personal attitudes, people seeing a person with a disability as somehow lesser, then there won't be the investment in addressing the barriers to economic participation, the physical infrastructure, the communication technology that might be needed to support people's full and equal participation in communities. So they're two separate sides, but I think they're sides of the same coin, that they're quite linked. And Alex, they have to be addressed at the same time. You you can't deal with one without the other. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes it's very much a staged approach. And I do think it's also very much about how an individual is placed in their social and cultural context as well. So you can have someone living in a very well infrastructured setting, but still have a high amount of stigma. So you do have to be able to address all the various barriers in a comprehensive way. Hoy, tell us a little bit about your story, how you came to use a wheelchair and what you see as the overriding issues facing people with a disability in the region. So the short version of my story is I contracted polio when I was 18 months in Vietnam, quite a poor community. At the age of six, I moved to Australia, grew up in Canberra. Um, it was a very severe case of polio where I you know, used a wheelchair full time. And in a way, I was privileged to grow up and to learn in, in a mainstream school and environment, really more or less forced into that environment and to gain those social skills. And um, later in life, after a few, you know, various challenges and questioning myself, my own identity, not just my own disability, you know, with culturally and all that stuff as well. Um, I went to dig deep into this to research about disability and learn more about myself along the way. You know, if you can phrase it, I gained a disability because of the terminology that came because before that I was just different. I know I was different. And the other kids still hanged out with me. We still got up to mischief. But uh, to really get into it intellectually, academically, sort of gained at that point, I gained a disability. Post that, I had significant opportunities to hear a lot of stories in various different countries, particularly more challenging countries from Timor to the Pacific Islands and, of course, in Asia as well, so Cambodia um, and recently Vietnam. And what's been really amazing is to see and to reflect on myself as an individual um, and to take that perspective as well on, I guess, how to view it disability in those different lenses. How different would your life be if you'd stayed in Vietnam? It would be significantly different. I can't say if it's worse or better because there's a very different way each community approaches disability. One wonderful thing about, you know, in a general kind of way about Asian societies is very family oriented. So, you know, you get support, you know, very much from your family. That still gets carried across here in Australia because I, you know, grew up with an Asian family. Um, that's been amazing to be able to, you know, have that support, um, have that safe environment. But at the same time, I've always fought to do things myself, to be independent, to mix with Australian culture or more Western culture to be more independent. So having a bit of blended of both and be able to have both of those has kind of like contributed to my success. So I think it would have been significantly different, probably a lot more challenged, um, actually, you know, in terms of actual access and physical barriers and educational barriers as well. We talk there about Vietnam, but we can't generalise across Asia. But Alex, do you have any sense of the the broad differences that we're likely to find in the lives of people with disabilities in Asia if we compare them to more developed, more wealthy countries? Yes. While the rights of persons with disabilities has been a universal declaration that has been signed by many countries, as well as across the Asia and Pacific region, I still think some of the attitudes towards people with disabilities are probably less progressed than they are in Western settings. I think partly that's because of disability and some of the cultural 
beliefs that are associated with disability, but also because in a lot of other settings, this sense of individual rights is probably quite different in, say, Australia as it is to China. And therefore, using the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has had profound effects for many people. It still perhaps hasn't influenced all levels of society, right from the legislation and the constitutions that countries have to the the investment that they provide for different sectors of society that may benefit people with disabilities. And Cathy, how different is that that response depending on the level of development in a country, the wealth of a country, that sort of thing? I mean, if you, if you look at the difference between a Cambodia and Australia or even a, a China and a Cambodia, is it linked to the level of development? In part, um, I think where you've got a a more robust economy, there is greater investment in infrastructure generally. So there are many parts of Asia where physical accessibility, for example, is very good, whether that's in Japan or Korea. Um, Countries like Korea actually have very advanced rehabilitation services um, for people with physical disabilities. But I would say there's quite a bit of inequality or inequity in many countries in the region. I'd actually say that applies in Australia as well. If you live in a rural or remote setting, your access to services is going to be a lot poorer than um, someone who lives in a capital city. In countries that I've worked in in the region, um, for example, Manila, Manila in the Philippines, if you uh, come from a family that lives in a wealthy part of town, you will have completely different access to services and opportunities. And there may also be quite different attitudes in the community towards disability if you live in a, a poor fishing village in a remote island. Which goes to education as well, doesn't it? It goes to education, it goes to exposure, it sometimes goes to advocacy. It's extraordinary what individual advocates can do in different communities um, to really change the way that people around them think. Um, and sometimes large-scale change can happen when there's an advocate in a very senior position of power. So I'm thinking back to historically in Pakistan, they were one of the first countries to embrace community-based rehabilitation and it's because the president's daughter had a disability. So sometimes it takes that personal connection for people to see the barriers that people have been long facing in their community around disability and to try and do something about it. Hoi, tell us a little bit about uh, Cambodia, a a country which has received a lot of development assistance, uh, especially aimed at people with a disability. Yeah, my time there was you know quite eye opening. Besides the work trips I've done, I'll come up from a I guess a personal perspective. I went there for a holiday, traveling by myself just to push it out there and see what happens. And it's actually quite a comfortable kind of country for a visitor who has displeased to go to because the people are really nice, really open, well welcoming, don't always stare you down. It's like, what is this person doing here in a way? But of course, infrastructure is very challenged. And um, what you've just talked about earlier around you know advocacy and seeing enough people around, you barely see anybody, let alone people who be able to kind of represent, um, really push forward in the community. And you're quite right to have people who have significant disabilities or family members who have that to really influence at the, you know, the senior levels. And whilst there's almost every NGO under the sun in Cambodia, there's, there's a lot of, I guess, focus on going straight to the DPOs. DPO? So Disabled People's Organisation, so the peak body that represents people with disabilities in Cambodia. They get all sorts of resources, funding, etc. But I still don't really see how much advancement that has made. And I wonder if that's because it's getting so used to this model of just, you know, externals coming in, providing us resource, capacity building, training the trainer, and where does it actually go to? But I managed to actually get to visit some of the groups of people with disabilities who hadn't received same resources as the main you know peak bodies and for them they're doing incredible things as well but they don't actually have been you know, uh, highlighted as much and you, you said yourself very very warm people very welcoming people yeah. but if we look at the cultural overlay what is the attitude towards people with a disability yeah. within their own families for example really still quite challenged and especially it goes to non-visible disabilities. I think it's even more challenging because it goes to what was mentioned before about education or understanding and knowledge about uh, what is the different types of disability, what are the causes of this. Um, I guess that's where a lot of my line of work is embedded into that. Um, How can we break that down into something that people can understand, add a bit of science to it, you know, what's behind the cause of that, of someone's intellectual disabilities, etc. And of course, those things can be quite complex and difficult to understand for a family in a real community community. So it's very challenging in those particular families. Alex, uh, Cambodia, of course, is a Buddhist country. Mm. Does that affect the way people view disability? Historically, absolutely. I think 
as in many other Asia and Pacific countries, there has been a link between disability and, say, karma, um, and that disability may be associated with sins of a past life. That, I think, we have seen really change over the last 10 to 20 years in Cambodia. I think when we've done our research there, people can remember being children and knowing other children that may have been taken away from the village because they had a disability. I think the peak bodies and also the DPOs at the local level have been really working hard to try and improve community understanding of both the causes of disability but also the rights of persons with disability. I think the challenge still in Cambodia as opposed to China where they've got similar legislation say for example in terms of employment quotas whereas China has a lot more resources to implement and monitor those legislations and they also use that as a revenue to then reinvest um, in the area of disability. Cambodia has similar legislation but not the resources to monitor, say, employment of persons with disabilities, whereas they're really relying on that function to then reinvest in in local disabled persons organisations. I think some of the really good work that DPOs are doing in the country are working with religious leaders. Religious leaders still hold a lot of clout and quite a high platform, and they're very connected to their community. So if you have your religious leader talking more positively around both the causes and the rights of people with disabilities, then that really does start to filter through into the community as well. Cathy, that problem of having uh, very good laws on paper, but then implementation and and follow-up and enforcement, that's not just a problem in Cambodia, is it? Absolutely not. Um, For example, in the Philippines, there's also quite high level, very high level legislation around disability and the rights of people with disability to access services, opportunities, information on an equal basis with others. And yet the ability of the government to enforce that is very limited. It would be the same across many of the Pacific countries. I mean, many parts of the world, uh, it's the monitoring and the enforcement of legislation. And sometimes the, the structures around that so that you may have, um, as Hoy was saying, one peak body that is getting bombarded with requests and responsibility to monitor, to be the spokesperson for people with disability, and they can't do it all. And there's not perhaps the investment in decentralising that across the country to make sure that there's someone who can represent the perspectives of people with disability from all kinds of parts of the country. In the Philippines, you've looked particularly at violence against people with a disability, especially women. Can you tell us a bit about that research? Because the UN talks about, quote, a pandemic of violence against women and girls with disabilities. I mean, that's an extraordinary word to use, isn't it? You could say that there's a pandemic of violence against women and girls full stop globally, Um, but the situation is substantially worse for women and girls with disability. There's also high levels of violence against men with disabilities. So violence against people with disabilities is a really significant issue that's under-recognised, that um, needs to have research done in a local context to understand the nuances of that, because certainly from our work in the Philippines, not all women and girls with disability are at equal risk of experiencing violence. So women with intellectual disability, um, women with communication impairments. So for example, if a woman is deaf and uh, doesn't have sign language that can be understood by anyone outside the family, so has informal sign language rather than Filipino, the official sign language, then her ability to report sexual violence or violence perpetrated by someone within the household is almost non-existent because the only way she can communicate outside the family is through a family member. So it makes it very difficult for, for women to access justice and perpetrators of violence often quite opportunistic and will take advantage of women where they think they can get away with it. We've seen this in Australia and we've seen this in the US. We've seen this in some of the wealthiest countries in the world. Do you think it is a particular issue in the Philippines? No, no. I think this is a global problem. Um, I think that the access to justice is also a problem in Australia um, and there's and a lot reporting of reporting. And, and, absolutely. Mm. So it's not just a problem in low-income countries in the region. I think Perhaps there are greater challenges in accessing services and supports in low-income countries because they're so overwhelmed anyway. Any woman experiencing violence will have difficulty accessing services and supports. But if you are a wheelchair user and the only 
counsellor who you can talk to about violence is on the third floor, you mm. don't have a, you don't have a choice. There there is not the services there, and the, certainly the work we did in the Philippines, some of it was around very basic things like have a facility where there's ground floor access, make sure the doors are wide enough for people to get in. If you're going to train people, make sure that you have access to sign language interpreters and so on. But Hoy, access to services is one thing. You have to know they're there. I mean, is there, a, is there a widespread knowledge of the rights and the availability of assistance for people with disabilities? The quick answer is no. <laughs> so, uh, but I'd just like to make a couple of notes before. Even right now in Australia, we've just starting our Royal Commission on the Violence and Abuse of People with Disabilities in Australia. You know, after many, many, many years of battles to get to this point, let alone thinking of other countries who don't have the capacity to or even have the resources to do that. And the access, you know, for the actual people themselves to raise a voice. There's obviously multiple compounded, you know, challenges, but there, there are probably potentially ways we can leapfrog a couple of processes, a couple of development steps in order to allow that. You know, for me, obviously coming from a technology background and working closely with people, um, noting one colleague who's doing SMS chatbots to access information about, you know, domestic violence and how you can help that. Those kind of things can be introduced quite quickly. Um, so using well. social media to, to tell people what their, not just what their rights are, but what services are available, how they can get Absolutely. help. Absolutely. And even easier now, it's just SMS. So we're not talking about even the internet. You know, we can use that SMS to get access information on where I can go discreetly. Um, that's my, you know, bit of my shout out to my good friend who's doing that. And it's called HelloCast. Um, to be able to discreetly find that information that's very accessible, because that's one of the biggest challenges, I guess, for us, people with disabilities in general, is access you know, or having information that's easy to access. Alex, what about how the rights exist on paper? And of course, on paper is one thing, implementation is another. But to what extent are the rights of people with disabilities actually legislated? For example, in Australia, we have the Disability Discrimination Act. And I I know that uh, there's a number of governments that have enacted anti-discrimination legislation. But to what extent is it, I suppose, first of all, enshrined in legislation? And secondly, taken seriously? It is very mixed across Asia and the Pacific. Um, There's still a number of countries that don't have legislation that legislates against discrimination and sometimes that legislation doesn't cover all aspects of society so it might cover education or it might cover employment but it still might not cover the right to vote um, or it might not cover the right to own land. So I think the anti-discrimination acts are very different in, in a number of countries and again I think it comes down to that capacity of countries and the willingness of countries to then monitor how they are implemented. Not many countries have a human rights commission such as a Australia or a disability specific commissioner as well where people can report on violations of rights. Also a number of people that we have worked with their awareness that their rights is so low or their awareness that they're actually experiencing violence. Many women with disabilities might not recognise the form of violence that they're actually exposed to. Not only is it difficult for them to report on it, but if they do manage to leave a relationship that is violent, the support networks or the social security networks aren't available. Um, so so women... So they, they're trapped, effectively. They're, they're both trapped, or if they do manage to leave, they find themselves in equally difficult circumstances. And when it comes to legislative rights and enforcement, what are the political obstacles to that? Perhaps if we go back to the Philippines where they have fought for a long time to introduce rights to sexual and reproductive health. For, in a strongly Catholic society. In a very strongly Catholic society. So the legislations that they have introduced are constantly under debate in the parliament. The other issue is that if, for example, you go to a hospital that the leader of the hospital is Catholic, they will perhaps create barriers to the procurement of both contraception but also other medicines that all women um, may require to support their sexual and reproductive health. The other issue that we see is... Um, Health nurses may be very happy to provide education to women with disabilities around sexual and reproductive health if they're married, but the assumption is that women with disabilities don't marry and they don't have children, therefore they don't need sexual and reproductive health. So, but, but the, the, f- the flip side of that, though, that it is in a country with a strong belief in the right to life, you would imagine that there would be a strong uh, defence of the rights of people with a disability to live a full life and to be protected. I think what you do see in terms of the influence of the right to life is perhaps less access to abortion. 
there is a lot of discussion around that right to life issue. When abortion comes up, then people with disabilities feel particularly under threat in places like the Philippines. And I do think in a country you are perhaps more likely to see children with Down syndrome in the community as opposed to other areas where access to safe abortion or the Catholicism isn't overlaid. But, or... it, but it doesn't translate to very strong enforcement of anti-discrimination legislation. No. There is a Magna Carta around the rights of people with disability in the Philippines. It's very high-level legislation. And there's a lot associated with the church. There's been a a lot of organisations established, often in quite rural areas, that were set up as charities um, to support people with disability in the community. And that's a positive thing to some degree. I think the challenge is allowing those organisations the opportunity to mature and rather being a charitable model, having organisations that can develop to ones where people are advocating for themselves and are rights-based rather than charity-based. We've worked with some fantastic disability advocates in, in the Philippines and a lot of the work we've done around violence and sexual and reproductive health has been about supporting those advocates um, or people who've got a lot of capacity and training around both their rights and the law and understanding about discrimination in the Philippines to then go and reach out to others who haven't had those same opportunities. And I think perhaps the most useful thing out of that long-term research we've done in the Philippines has been the establishment of peer support groups for women with different types of impairments. So a group of women who all have a hearing impairment, who are all deaf or hard of hearing, um, supporting each other in knowing what their rights are and then supporting each other in actually seeking advice for a violent husband or seeking advice on how to access contraception and so on. And they often go together. (laughs) And that lasts after the intervention because you've built a group that have solidarity, um, who can stay in contact through social media and who many of those women have gone on to do really quite impressive things without um, outside intervention. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by engineer and social entrepreneur Hoi Nguyen, Alex Devine from the Nossel Institute for Global Health and Dr Cathy Vaughan, who you were just listening to, of the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. We're talking about living with disabilities in Asian societies. Hoi, in countries where even basic health care can be a challenge, what happens to people with a disability? Do they just slide down the scale of importance? The sad reality is, uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I've seen quite a few cases where people with disabilities are literally outcast from the community and there's a lack of understanding about that individual. And it's even more challenging where people who don't have those family supports. That's the group that is most significantly challenged. And even here in Australia as well, people don't have advocates on behalf, don't have families on behalf. That's a sad reality, um, even having access to basic health services. Thinking about the reasons why, why would that be the case is, is around the community and understanding and education. But I think it comes down to just not knowing how to support or help someone because people, I think in general, you know, we want to help each other. And when we don't know how to support that individual, we kind of like generally kind of ignore it or leave it to someone else. So usually when people have complex disabilities, it's not because I think people we want to exclude or, you know, remove people in our community, we just don't know how to support or help someone. So that obviously goes to education, which we'll discuss further in a minute. But Alex, can I ask you about the link between poverty and disability? Absolutely. And I think it's a link that's established early on in in a person's life. I think, again, if we go back to Cambodia, but we can use the same example from the Philippines. If a family has a child with a disability and the social support and the social security is not there, then that family may find it very difficult to continue working at the same level and therefore their income starts to drop, but also therefore their capacity to care for their child with a disability starts to drop. That might then impact on that child's access to school and later their access to work. So throughout their course, they've got more costs, but not necessarily the resources to address that cost. And we do again see that in Cambodia where they've done such an incredible job to reduce poverty rates across the country, but for families with a family member with a disability, the rates of poverty are significantly higher. So 18% of families with a person with a disability still remain in poverty compared to 13% of families without a disability. But when you take into consideration the costs of disability, then that can go up to 35%. 
Whereas in Australia, and I think this is maybe the purpose of the NDIS, prevent, National Disability the National Insurance Disability Scheme. Insurance Scheme, um, is to prevent families from incurring all the costs of disability. Uh, we also have much greater access to childcare so parents can still work. We're also not relying on on agriculture or changing agricultural landscape, which is happening in Cambodia as well. So families potentially would have been able to continue the sort of work that they were doing to bring in bring in income, whereas that is changing across Asia as well. And sorry, is that the cost of time taken away from a carer? For someone with disabilities, that some of the costs. So you're both, about? so direct yeah. and indirect costs. So it might be the cost associated with more cost to to get the healthcare that you need. It might be that someone has a greater need for nutrition. Um, it might be that someone needs greater heating, but also the time that it costs. So again, I think that's why in some contexts you see more children with disabilities. Families finding it difficult to keep children with disabilities within that family unit, which we know is the best thing for all children, probably particularly for children with disabilities. So what about uh, representation in broader society, Cathy? How, how well represented are people with disabilities in secondary education and also in the workforce? Across the region, people with disability have lower levels of participation in the education sector and um, in the workforce as they do in Australia, particularly in the workforce in Australia where we do poorly. So it's a compounding issue. If you don't have access to education, then your employment opportunities are reduced. And it's very difficult to try and catch up at the job-seeking end of things when you haven't had access to basic primary school education or into secondary school or beyond. And then when people aren't in the workforce or aren't in education, I think that reinforces prejudice. And this is what I was saying about the two sides of the same coin. If people are not visible in a society, they're not seen as able to be in school, they're not visible in a workplace, people aren't exposed to people with disability and realise they're, well, they're just just like me, then it's difficult to overcome prejudice because people... Because they're hidden away, out correct. of sight, out of yeah. mind. Yeah. And you, you made that point at the beginning of this conversation about the president whose daughter had a disability in Pakistan. Just what a difference a, a, a single role model can do to having the conversation and putting it at the forefront of what's being talked about. Absolutely. And um, we see that currently in the region where there will be people who, through their own personal exposure to disability or, of course, acquiring a disability, any of us who at the moment don't have a disability could acquire a disability, um, it can really change your perspective on the, the position of people who've spent their whole life dealing with communication barriers and physical access barriers and attitudinal barriers, and that can make an enormous difference um, in a particular setting. But we shouldn't have to wait until someone um, has a child with a disability or acquires a disability themselves. Um, we should all be able to recognise the you know intrinsic rights of all people, including people with disabilities. Can I add an example onto what you're talking about there about exposure in a good kind of way? So I had a trip to China um, about two years ago and in one of the cities I was at, uh, I was catching a train and uh, to the side of my eye, I, I can see this woman taking her camera out, taking a sneaky photo of me. That quickly turned around, looked at her, she put it away and turned away. She did that again. Didn't feel comfortable because for her, I know what situation, she's never seen someone, you know, uh, even in a wheelchair who's traveling on a train by themselves uh, in China. And that's, you know, exactly what you're talking about is that just the more exposure, more people out there to really start to, uh, to you know, get that across. Um, and even just the basic stuff is like wheelchair users, there's not that many that's coming around. There's even that barrier just to go out because, you know, people are taking, taking photos of you as well in that first instance. How much of changing this is selling the benefits of integrating people with a disability into the workforce? A forget the human side of it, just do a straight cost benefit analysis. Is that hard, Cathy, to, to sell the benefits? There are challenges because even the data on prevalence of disability in, in many countries is not there. Earlier on, we were talking about underreporting and underrepresentation. That's often because how disability is measured in a country is not done to the standards that it should be. So if you just, in a census, ask the head of the household, is there someone with a disability in your house, you get a very different answer than if you ask about activities. Um, if you ask if someone has difficulty seeing or difficulty hearing or difficulty moving around, um, you will get a very different prevalence. And it is hard to argue to governments to invest if they think it's only 1% or 2% of the population. If they have the data to demonstrate that it's a much higher proportion of the population who has a disability, then there's a greater willingness. 
I think, though, the issue around um, the economic argument for investing in all members of the society is a really good one. And we've seen it with increasing participation of women in the workforce. Equally, we should be seeing it with of increasing participation of people with disability. And of course, recognising that for many, that's the same person. I think sometimes we talk about disability like it happens in a vacuum. But of course, people with disability are also women. They're men. They're people from ethnic minorities or religious minorities. So this can be intersecting forms of discrimination that can prevent people having access to opportunities as well as disability. Hoi, if we can go back to something that you mentioned at the very outset, independence. How important is that and how difficult is it, particularly in an Asian context, to make people understand not how they think they should help, but how they should help? Well, I think it's, you know, we're quite challenging. Let me give an example of my recent trip to Vietnam. I'm fiercely independent, right? Like, I want to do things myself. Um, However, that kind of offends people as well when you're in country. They really want to help and they want to, you know, be recognized as being helpful as well. You know, when I was moving around, people insisted to carry me around, move me, you know, carry me upstairs, etc. They think it was absolutely quite fine. But when I say no, they get offended. For me to, to be able to communicate that from my perspective as an individual... But at times I just got to give in just a bit um, and let people help, right? So well, it's a little bit about pride, but I think it's it's how we in certain cultures where you know being helpful is is not a way where um, it's actually demeaning you as an individual person with disability. It's both sides of the equation there. Alex, we started this conversation talking about the numbers and talking about underreporting. To what extent has health research focused on disability? I work in a health institute and we do have a disability unit, but I also have a number of colleagues that work in health systems and I do find that it's taken a number of years and we're definitely there now, I think, to convince them that disability is part of a health system as well and that people with disability have the same right to health as people without disability and then to make sure that when you are doing health research that you do include a lens of disability as well in terms of if you're identifying the barriers to health services in a country, you can't just do that for people that are able-bodied, um, but you also do need to consider different, different types of challenges and different types of disabilities as well. So, Cathy, does there need to be more research that actually involves people with a disability as opposed to does it round them? Absolutely. And I think that's across all forms of um, health research. Sometimes there's a, certainly in our own research, which was around sexual and reproductive health and violence, the, the work we were talking about earlier in the Philippines, we were specifically looking at the experiences of, of women with disability. So a very large proportion of our research team were women with disability. They were women with disability interviewing other women with disability. We did a prevalence study. Half the team of enumerators going out and collecting data for the prevalence study were people with disability. And they bring new insights into the data that you wouldn't get if you were just a research team that didn't have um, members with disability in there. So it totally enriched our analysis um, and changed the focus of some of our findings, particularly in relation to sexual and reproductive health. But I think it needs to be not just about research that's specifically about people with disability. For example, non-communicable diseases, which is a huge issue in the Asian region and growing, um, we know there's a strong link between some forms of disability and non-communicable diseases. Partly a non-communicable disease can be a cause of disability if you have a stroke, for example. But also if your diet is affected by poverty and that poverty is associated with disability or if your um, ability to exercise is infected by impairment and that has an association with non-communicable diseases. There's increasing evidence around the association between the two. But you don't see very many non-communicable disease research projects that include team members with disability. And I think that would be a huge step forward is if we, all forms of health research had, you know, an eye to inclusion, um, not just projects specifically um, about the experiences of people with disability or in the rehab sector, which is where historically there's been um, perhaps, I don't think that's actually been very inclusive research, but there's been more awareness that people with disability might need to use those services. So I think it cuts across any form of health research. We should be including people with disability. And indeed, any form of research. And and the Australian (laughs) government is now supporting that in terms of supporting the work that we do to build the capacity of all development researchers to include people with disabilities in the research they do. And the other 
real benefit that has is that communities then see people with disabilities in positions of employment and positions of power, and that can really change attitudes too. And in fact, Hoi, you've got a really interesting story about uh, a friend of yours in Vietnam who runs a business. Tell us about the challenges that she faces. Yeah, so she is becoming quite successful. She has a quite high level of physical impairment, but now she owns and runs a business, like a business business, so where she employs other people with disabilities to take on digital projects, uh, digital photo uh, manipulation, etc., and in terms of from recent other countries. We talk a lot. One of the biggest challenges that she had is in in her leadership role is being challenged internally as well, where um, her own staff sort of sees her as someone with disabilities who in their perception may not have, because of her disabilities, may not have the qualities or the skills from just pure perception to lead them himself internally because of such an ingrained you know prejudice and all that kind of stuff even in her own team is is what she tells me about you know one of the challenges which i think is very fascinating so so they're saying because you have a disability we don't have to listen to you in a way you know what credibility you bring and that's significantly challenging um not just with all the external factors that she's really dealing with so coming off that can i ask you travel especially when you travel around the region how confident are you that the path to change, whether that is on a more government infrastructure economic side or whether it is on those deep-seated cultural traditions, do you think that path is becoming well-trodden? To change, to positive change? I think it is in in a way, especially more globalised, connected world, when you have people with disabilities, you know, like myself, travelling to other countries. People can see us around. I think where some of the exciting space that uh, I think is going to really happen is around more tourists who have disabilities that can travel around, that have spending power, be able to go to places, be able to communicate with people and just listen and share their stories. So I think that connected global world where we can now travel around and have the sports, I guess, you know, the ability to do that is one way forward, I guess, in terms of being able to have change happen. And this big shift of movement right now, which is my world around social entrepreneurship or social impact, really taking things from a, a business perspective, a business lens. Business is really thinking and including and thinking about all this, um, any kind of business really, because how cross-cutting disability is, how it impacts in all areas of our life. And I think through uh, entrepreneurship as a way to proceed with that. So I guess my thing there is increasing number of globally connected communities, sharing information, knowing what's out there, knowing the resources out there, travelers who have disability. And that uh, is another significant way as well as businesses uh, moving forward, especially social impact businesses. Alex, are you optimistic? I am optimistic and I think you have to be optimistic, but I do think that it requires ongoing advocacy and and really continuing to shine the spotlight on things that we can do across the region. And it does require ongoing investment from the Australian government and other governments in the work that they do with countries across Asia and the Pacific. And it does, again, require ongoing work with people with disabilities to identify the ongoing issues and, and what the solutions are. So there's a long way to go, but there's absolute reason to be optimistic. Cathy, I guess we're talking about it. That's that's a good thing. It's a good start. I think that, um, like Alex, I'm optimistic. I'm very mindful of that in this region, it's a region of incredibly rapid change. I'm very hopeful about locally driven solutions. Um, having visited, for example, um, the National Rehab Service in Korea and watching how Korean engineering and technology and ingenuity is being put to use in the disability sector was mind-blowing. It's absolutely fantastic what they're doing there. So I think that there are um, opportunities around the region with the rapid change that happens, um, as Hoy said, to jump some of the steps that have happened in countries like Australia and and leapfrog ahead. So we have to be optimistic, recognising that there's still a long way to go. A long way to go, but as you say, at least some progress has been made uh, and and some better analysis of the challenges. An enormous thank you to to all of you for your insights, to Cathy and to Alex and to Hoy. Thank you very much for talking to Ear to Asia. Thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you. Our guests have been Dr Cathy Vaughan of the Centre for Health Equity at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, Alex Devine from the Nossel Institute for Global Health, and engineer and social entrepreneur Hoi Nguyen.
Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or SoundCloud. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And of course, let your friends know about us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 19th of July, 2019. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2019, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.